Welcome back to the seminar. The next presentation is about hacking retro games. Uh, please welcome all the way from the UK, Paul Grenfell. Hi, um, I'm Paul. I'm going to be talking about hacking retro games. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one specific example. Um, and I'm just going to go through these different stages. What is a trainer? Um, the target game I'm actually going to be hacking or training, uh, the target platform that it's running on. Then we'll get into the trainer itself, how that works. And then we'll get on to why is it like a rocket? So we'll start off with what is a trainer? Um, so is it this kind of trainer? No. Um, so we'll go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is always a great source of uh, definitions. So Wikipedia says, trainers are programs made to modify memory of a computer game, thereby modifying its behavior uses addre using addresses and values in order to allow cheating. Pretty awful definition. Um, so this is the kind of trainer we're talking about. I'm sure most of you have seen something similar at some point. He's a trainer for, for Grand Theft Auto. So the idea is you run the game and then you run the trainer and the trainer will uh, enable certain cheats and superpowers, enhancements, that kind of thing. Um, you have a cheat menu, you toggle all these things on and off, you go back to the game, you have infinite health, you have infinite ammunition, whatever you want. So my definition of trainer is, is a little bit different from Wikipedia. Um, I think that trainers are programs made to modify the memory of a computer game to enable various cheats and enhancements. But they are also a calling card, showing off the skills of the people who make them. So I'm talking more about this kind of trainer. Um, this is actually a trainer from 2016, but it's, it's a classic uh, old school Amiga style trainer. Um, you have a big, uh, some big nice logo graphics in the corner. You have your trainer menu in the middle with the cheats that you can turn on and off. Um, you have a scrolling message at the bottom. You'll have some music playing in the background. Uh, and in this one, there's a, there's a spinning cube, just a, a sort of a 3D effect in the background. So it's kind of a calling card. Somebody has taken the time to train the game and they want you to know who they were and they want to show off a little bit. Um, and this is kind of, um, this was one of the roots of the demo scene. People started off making trainers and they made them more and more elaborate. And eventually the demo scene was, was born from people deciding they just want to make the nice graphics and the nice music. They don't want to actually hack the games. So trainers go right back to the roots of the demo scene. OK, so let's talk about the target game. So the game I'm going to look at, one of my favorite games ever, um, is called Ant Attack um, by a guy called Sandy White. Um, released in 1983. So um, I'm just going to show some videos of it um, and talk through those. So the idea of Ant Attack was you had to go into an abandoned city that had been taken over by giant ants and rescue somebody. So here I am going into, the, uh, going into this 3D world. You can see somebody lying down there. I have a lack of audio. Yeah, the audio on the spectrum wasn't much to talk about. And each, each level this game got harder. Um, and the, the people you had to rescue were hidden in more and more elaborate and harder to find places. So you find you have to search the level. All you've got is this little green and red radar down the bottom that just tells you if you're running in the right direction. Um, so the person I'm looking for, I think, is yep over there. There's the ants. Um, so the ants will come away and bite you, take away your energy. If they take away your energy, it's game over. You've got these grenades that you can throw at them to try and kill them or stun them. So just going to turn around and try and stun some some ants. There you go, right, they're stunned. Let's run for the exit as fast as we can. And the ants will start chasing us again. And the controls of the game were a bit dodgy as well, which made it more exciting, shall we say. So 
that's basically it. Um, you keep doing that. There are 10 levels. It gets harder and harder each time. So Ant Attack for me was a really exciting game. It was, um, it was survival horror. Um, this was sort of 15, 20 years before. I think it was Konami that actually coined the term survival horror. Um, it used voxels. It was a proper voxel um, landscape. Uh, this is obviously much more popular now with games like Minecraft. Um, it's got a strong claim to being the first isometric 3D game ever. Um, Zaxxon was a similar kind of game. Well, not similar. It was an arcade shoot -em up at the same time that was often claimed to be the first isometric 3D game, but I think this is true 3D world. Um, and it's also sandbox. Um, that was the most interesting thing for me, that the whole game was, was, was a giant sandbox. You could do what you were supposed to do, or you could just have fun. You could explore this world. Um, I've just got a quick video of that. So I can make my own rules. I can uh, see if I can run to the end of this elaborate looking structure without falling off. And I can use the timer to see how quickly I can do it. And sandbox games weren't really a thing in 1983. The, 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 the term hadn't been coined until a long time later. But this, for me, was what made the game fun. I could come back, I could keep making my own rules and just enjoy it. So can I get to the end of the structure without falling off? Yes, hooray. And just for reference, there's the entire map. Um, lots of exotic things to go and explore. Um, and obviously, you don't see the entire map. You have to go and investigate it yourself. Um, just lots to do. A very big map again for 1983. So now we'll talk about the target platform. Um, it was the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. It's released in 1982. Uh, it has 16K of ROM. Uh, so the ROM, uh, the Spectrum had a basic interpreter in it, a basic programming language, also routines to load and save from cassette, things like that. That's what's included in your 16K ROM. 48K of RAM, which obviously by today's standards is absolutely tiny. Um, you have one bit audio. Uh, the speaker was literally on the, on the underside of the, the, the Spectrum, was a uh, little one bit piezo speaker. That's where all the audio comes from. It doesn't even come out of the television. It comes out the bottom of the computer. Absolutely terrible audio. Uh, the screen resolution is 256 by 192 pixels. Again, very small. Um, you had 16 colors, except two of them were black. So you kind of had 15 colors, and there were limitations about how you could actually use those colors. Um, and it was a, a, an 8-bit um, Z80 processor running at 3.5 megahertz. So really, really not very powerful at all. But in 1982, this was kind of getting on for cutting edge, I think, for, for home computers. And it was cheap and it was affordable. And it sold millions as a result. Um, so I just want to show you the memory map quickly. We'll get onto this later. Uh, but the memory map of the Spectrum is the bottom is the system ROM, which is 16K. You've got the screen memory there, which is just under 7K. So the screen memory, um, uh, the memory was mapped directly to the screen. What data you write into that 6,912 bytes of code gets written directly to the screen. You're not using a graphics processor or anything like that. If you write data there, it appears on the next time the, the screen is updated to the monitor or television. Um, then you've got system variables and buffers. Then you've got about 41K for the basic program and variables. And then you've got a little bit spare at the top, 168 bytes. And the other exciting thing about the Spectrum was that uh, you had to load games from cassette tape. So games generally took around five minutes to load, and you'd have to sit there and wait for this game to load and pray and hope that it actually loaded. It wasn't until much later that people started adding disk drives. Um, these days, if you have a Spectrum, you just buy a little uh, compact flash adapter, and you load your games in a second. Back then, we had to wait five minutes. We didn't have the internet, so we didn't have much else to do. Um, OK, so let's go on to the trainer that I wrote for Ant Attack. So it's going to be a classic trainer. It's going to have a cheap menu. It's going to have a big scrolling message. It's going to have three-channel sound. It's going to have pet ski graphics. So the three-channel sound is interesting. As I say, it's a one-pit audio system. Um, 
getting three channels out of that is, is pretty impressive. I didn't write the code. Um, there are a bunch of uh, three-channel audio engines that you can get quite readily, so I borrowed one of those. Petsky Graphics. If any of you know your Commodores, you'll know Commodores had Petsky Graphics. Spectrums didn't. Um, I just liked Petsky Graphics. So I thought it would be funny to have a um, Petsky Graphics on a Spectrum. Um, I have a, a guy called Tim Kosh, who I work with, um, who makes amazing Petsky Graphics and kindly offered to do, uh, do some graphics for me. Uh, the music is by a guy called Format, who's a, a um, great old school uh, demo scener. Um, I'll just show you a quick video of the trainer. So you have your scroller, you have your cheat menu, you have your music. Okay, so we'll get on to the individual cheats and enhancements. So there are some obvious ones here. Infinite health, infinite time, infinite ammunition, immunity to degrade to grenades. The most embarrassing way to die in the game was to blow yourself up with your own grenade. It was easy to do, so frustrating. So let's get rid of that. And then we have a couple of enhancements. We're going to do rendering speed ups and we're going to put some new graphics into the game as well. So we'll just go through these one by one. Um, so the first one we're going to do is infinite health. This is a pretty simple kind of hack or, or crack to start off with. Um, the, I've got um, a Z80 assembler code. I've got the before and after on the left and right. I'm going to talk through a little bit what they're, what they're for, but I won't go too in-depth through it. If you know Z80, this will make sense. If you don't, it would take far too long for me to explain it fully. So I'll just go over the, the kind of basics. So on the before, um, basically what we do is we load HL with an address. That points one of the, the processor's um, registers at where the health is stored, and then decrease the contents of that. So we're decreasing our health by one. Really easy way to change that is, rather than decreasing health by, by one, we change that instruction to a no-op. No-op does nothing. So now our health is no longer going down. Now we have infinite health. Really easy. Infinite time is a little bit harder. Um, I use the same approach to start with, just changing it so it doesn't go down. But then I realized a bit of a subtle flaw with this. So I said earlier on that there are um, different positions that the characters you're trying to save can appear in. It turns out that um, the timer is um, used to decide which position will be there in the next level. So the timer is actually composed of three bytes. The first two bytes first two bytes hold the number 0 to 1,000, which is what you actually see on the, on the game screen, counting down. The third byte is used as a little two-bit counter, so it just counts 3, 2, 1, 0, and then the main timer goes down, and then 3, 2, 1, 0, the main timer goes down 1. The 3, 2, 1, 0 is used by the game to decide which random position to place the person you're rescuing from in the next game. So all we do is we make sure that that keeps counting down but the bigger counter never counts down. And I do that just by constantly resetting it. I reload it with 1001, and then it gets decreased. So the small counter is still doing its job, and we can still use it. The big counter isn't changing at all. Infinite ammunition. Infinite ammunition is another relatively simple one. Every time you press the fire button, you go into this routine. Um, it loads the current value of your number of grenades. Um, uh, it checks to see whether it's naught. If it is, break out of the routine. You don't throw a grenade. Then it decreases it and stores it back into memory. And again, all we do is we change the decrease to a no-op, so you're never actually losing grenades. You've always got four grenades. Um, immunity to grenades, that all-important cheat. Again, that's relatively simple. A routine gets called when a grenade blows up. Um, it checks to see whether you're in the same uh, location as the grenade. Um, if you're not, then there's a return, a conditional return, return NZ. Um, and all I do is just change that so it always returns. So it makes the test to see whether you're there, then it doesn't care, it just returns. 
so it will never do the rest of the routine that will actually kill you. So next we get on to the enhancements. Um, so I thought, as well as actually training the game, the whole game itself is a little bit slow, um, and there are modern techniques that can speed it up, and that makes it a little more fun, a little more responsive to play. So the two enhancements I've got are a new routine to clear the back buffer and um, a new fast sprite renderer. So the back buffer. Um, because the spectrum memory is uh, mapped directly to the screen, uh, there's a component inside the spectrum that's 50 times a second, drawing that, copying it to the screen. Whatever's in memory will get shown to the screen. So if you're drawing your game screen to that memory, and it takes you a couple of frames to do it, whilst that's happening, it will still be being drawn to the screen. So you will see the, the, the game screen being drawn bit by bit, bits of it being built up, and it will look horrible. So what people did was they reserved a separate piece of memory, um, they wrote all their graphics to there, and then, as quickly as they could, they copied it back to the screen so that you would then see it, I mean, you didn't see it being drawn up. The first stage of um, that was that you would clear the back buffer. So there's a big chunk of memory, you need to clear it. And then you can draw the new, the new screen image on there. Um, so the old routine to do this was horribly inefficient. Um, the way it works is you set a pointer to the, the start of your back buffer, you get another register, you put naught in it, and then you copy that to the first byte, increase the pointer to point to the next byte, copy that to the next byte, increase the pointer. You keep doing that, and you do that a few thousand times. And it works, but it, it, it's quite slow. Um, and there was another weird thing as well, in that actually this routine cleared, um, each time you called it, it would clear every fourth line. So the first time you called it, it would clear lines one, four, and eight, the second time two, five, and nine, and so on. Um, and then it, that was called four times. So it would clear the whole screen, but it would do it in four calls to a very inefficient routine. I don't really know why that was done. I can't figure it out, um, but it was, it was a very slow way to do it. Um, so when you're optimizing, the important thing is to worry about your inner loops. And the inner loop for this was, as I say, it's just copying a byte of memory and then increasing the pointer. And that was taking 11 clock cycles per byte. Um, the new routine that I've, I wrote to replace it takes 11 clock cycles for two bytes. So it's half as, or twice as quick. Um, and the way we do this is using the stack. This is quite a common routine, or quite a common technique, certainly on the spectrum, and I guess on uh, other 8 to 16-bit computers as well. Um, so the stack is, uh, if you call a subroutine, the address will get pushed onto the stack, and then when you return the subroutine, the address will be called back off the stack. So the stack is a, an area of memory that grows downwards, and you store temporary variables on it. So we can kind of abuse this, um, and the technique here for clearing a buffer is, we point the stack to the end of the buffer, and then we push zero onto the stack. And each time we push zero, we're copying two bytes on, uh, over the back buffer. So we do that a couple of thousand times. And it's, it's twice as quick as um, the manual version. And actually, this routine works out to be smaller and faster. So it's, it's a win. Um, so the, uh, this shows the number of clock cycles taken to clear the screen in the light blue bar. The dark blue bar is the number of uh, clock cycles available entire frame. So you're running at 50 hertz. The big blue bar is how many clock cycles the Z80 can do in one screen update. It's about 70,000. Uh, and the, the clearing routine was happening and taking somewhere over 40,000 cycles, quite a lot of time. The new faster version takes about half as much. Um, so we're down to about 2,000. So that buys you back a lot of time. Um, every time you buy back, an amount of time like that, it just makes the game slightly more responsive, um, slightly less sluggish, slightly more fun to play. Um, so the next one was a sprite renderer. And the sprite renderer, again, it's, it's not massively efficient. Um, so we can see all of the sprites that are in the game. You can see the characters, you can see the ants, 
explosions. There's a plane in there, four, four sprites for plane. It's not used in the game at all. Don't know why it's there. But that's, I don't know, maybe some sort of Easter egg. There's an extra little bit of graphics in there. So each sprite is 16 by 16. Um, eight pixels fits into a single byte. So you have two bytes per line. And 16 lines down gives you 32 bytes per sprite. Um, but these are masked sprites. So the first byte is the mask, and the second byte is the actual data. So you double that. You're talking 64 bytes per sprite. So when you're drawing a sprite, you're copying 64 bytes of data around, merging it with the screen. So the old sprite renderer um, is not massively efficient. Um, it's about 44 clock cycles um, per uh, byte. So what it's doing, um, there's a pointer set up to the screen or the screen buffer, and there's a pointer set up to the sprite data. So we load a byte from the screen, we mask it with the mask data, increase the pointer in the sprite data, and then we merge in the actual data, we increase the pointer, then we copy that back to the screen, and then we increase the screen pointer. It's not a bad way of doing it, but again, we can use the stack technique so we point the stack at the sprite data, we pop the, the two bytes off, merge them with the screen, and then push it back onto the screen. And it saves us a few cycles. On top of that, there's another technique for optimization, which is to unroll the loops. So the old sprite render was doing the equivalent of a loop 16 times. It would write one sprite byte, write the second sprite byte, point to the next line of the screen, decrease a loop counter, go back to the stop of the loop. That's OK, um, but actually you lose a little bit of overhead in the managing the, um, the loop counter. So when you unroll the loop, all you do is rather than having one loop that's operated 16 times, you have the same piece of code copied 16 times. So we write one sprite byte, write the next one, point to the next line of the screen, then immediately the next byte, next byte, next line of screen. And this unrolling, again, saves us a few clock cycles. Um, so the original version was taking 2,270 clock cycles. Now we've got 1,335. The game really slows down when you've got about five characters on the screen. So um, with the old one was taking 11,000 to draw five sprites. The new one's taking 6,000. And if you look at that with the before and after again, it's not a huge difference. Um, but it's again, it's enough. Uh, the game gets sluggish when there's lots of characters on the screen. This is quite often just enough to make it run one frame faster and make it feel like a nicer game. But there's a bit of a problem. So our old sprite render was 26 bytes. Um, our new sprite render is 204 bytes. So what we've been doing previously is just changing the odd byte or two of the old code. Here, we've got a completely new routine. We've got 204 bytes. And the memory is pretty full on the machine, because the game is already loaded there. So we've got to find somewhere where we can fit 204 bytes. Luckily, um, if you remember the aeroplane that has no use in the game, and each one of those sprites is 64 bytes inside, so that gives us 256 bytes. Great. So we copy our new sprite routine over some unused graphics, and we patch the old routine to jump to our new routine and then return back. And that buys us some, uh, some extra clock cycles. Um, the last one is new graphics. I won't go into the, how these are done. This is pretty simple, just changing some data bytes here and there. Um, the before is what it looks like before on the, on the left. On the right are the new graphics. I just made them have a grid on them. It just makes it easier to judge. And, uh, also, it's a 30-year-old game. I think it's just nice to refresh some of the graphics a little bit, make it a little bit more interesting. So now we get onto the rocket. And why is a trainer like a rocket? So we go back to the memory map, and we look at the memory map when ant attack is running. We have the ROM at the bottom. We have the screen memory. We have the system variables of buffers again. The game code takes up about 9K. Then we have 16K of, of machine code that's actually running the game, doing the, the sound effects, drawing the graphics, all those kind of things. 
and at the top we have uh, 16K of map data. That voxel map data takes up a whole 16K. And the trainer we saw earlier on, with the menu and the graphics and the, uh, the music, that's how big it is. It's nearly 8K. So it doesn't fit. There's nowhere to fit that in the game. And that's a problem for us, because that's, that's the most important part of this whole trainer process. So now we're we'll going to why a trainer is like a rocket. Um, and the reason it's like a rocket is that we're going to deliver the trainer in stages. And each one of these stages is going to contain and power all of the stages that follow it. And at each stage, we will jettison the old stage and just lose it, and then carry on with a lighter payload and lighter payload until we get right to the end. So we'll start with the first stage. Uh, the first stage is, is the boot stub itself. This is the first thing you load. It's 446 bytes long. It contains compressed version of all the stages that follow it. So the boot stub just clears the screen, shows a logo. The second stage, 4,062 bytes long. So what the second stage does is um, load in the rest of the game. So at this point, you would take your original Antitac cassette, you would put it in the cassette player, you would press play, and it would load. Um, we use the original loading routines to do this. The only difference is we do them under our control so that when the game is finished, we can jump back to our code and carry on our rocket process. So the, the trainer is 4,060, uh, this stage, sorry, is 4,062 bytes long. Um, the trouble is, when we load the game, it's going to fill up all our memory. So we've got to find somewhere to store this stage. So luckily, we have the screen memory at this point. Uh, the screen memory is, if you remember, about 7K long. Um, what we can actually do is copy this 4K over the screen memory and run it from the screen memory. Um, and we can do some tricks with changing colors so that you can't actually see the code. So the black and blue and red and yellow squares at the bottom, the 8-bit logo, um, if I remove the colors on those, actually you see that the game code, so the, the stage for this code is hidden behind there. Um, and that code is 462 bytes long. The space we have there is 4,096. This is the tightest fit of the whole process. We have about 34 bytes to spare. If the trainer got much bigger, the whole process wouldn't work. So now Antitac has loaded. We've still got our trainer, main, uh, trainer in the screen memory, and we're back to this problem. We've got to fit that trainer code which is currently compressed in the screen memory. We've got to fit it somewhere in the Spectrum's main memory, uncompressed, so that we can run it. It's nearly 8K. Um, we can't do the same trick we did before where we put it over the screen. It's too big for the screen. And also, we actually want to show some graphics on the screen, so we can't put code there. Um, we could find, maybe compress the game code. That might work. But we need the game code to stay where it, stay where it is, because we're going to be changing values in it. Luckily, the map data is 16K. And as you saw in the map earlier on, it's quite sparse. So what we can do is compress that in place. So that's what we do. We compress the map data. Just simple runtime compression takes it from 16K down to just over 3,000 bytes. That's less than 20% of the original size. Um, gives us 13K of free space. And that's more than enough. We only need 8K. So that we compress the map, we decompress the trainer, um, stick it up in the top section of memory that's now free, and then we jump to the code. And now we're on to stage three. The trainer is now installed in memory, and it's running. So the trainer itself is 7,720 bytes long. Um, that's made up of a number of different things. The font for the pet ski is 2K. Um, the graphics uh, character layout for the background is 1,500 bytes. It's 403 bytes for the music player, about 2K for the music data. It leaves us about 1,600 bytes for all the other stuff. So that's the code that will actually install the cheats, um, control the cheat menu, that kind of thing. So at this point, we choose our cheats. Um, we hit Enter to start. 
the trainer engine will go away and install those cheats. We're still not quite finished. We've still got to get back to the main game. Um, and at the moment, the map doesn't exist anymore because we compressed it. So there's one last stage to this, which is stage four. In stage four is the tiniest payload of all. This has been carried all the way through from all the other stages right to the end. And this is, this, is, this is like landing on the moon. This is the final bit. And what we do, we copy these 38 bytes into screen memory, and then we jump to it. And what these 38 bytes do is decompress the map back into the original position, and then jump back into the game code. Um, and that's it. We've, in, we've um, gone through several stages, uh, installed our trailer, and then jumped back to the game code. Game has no idea anything's happened, but we've installed all of our cheats and all of our enhancements. So I'm just going to show a quick video of the whole process. As I said, games take five minutes to, to load. Um, I'm not going to make you sit through the whole five minute process, it's a bit boring. But I'll just show you the start of the process. So this is loading in our trainer. This is what loading games was like in 1983. We had to sit and watch this for five minutes and listen to that noise. Okay, there's our stage one. Stage two, now you put the original ant attack cassette in. I'll just let this go a little bit and then I'll turn on turbo loading so you won't have to sit through the whole five minutes. Turbo loading. Now we're on to stage three. So we have our, our main trainer menu. This is the, the, the main point of it. Um, choose your cheats. Of course, we're going to choose all of your cheats. Why wouldn't we choose all of the cheats? Enter to start. That was stage four running. And now we're into the game. And there we are, new graphics, infinite time. Your health and your ammo are infinite as well. And I'll just stop before the ants come and attack me. Um, and that's it. Um, any questions? Okay, so how did you decompile and make sense of the game code? Okay, um, it's much easier to hack games these days when you have emulators. So um, most of this work, well, all of this work was done in, a, in an emulator. Um, there are two emulators I used. There's one called ZX Spin, one called MUZWin. Um, they both let you pause the game at any point. Um, it's still using the same techniques you would have used 20, 30 years ago, but it's just made a lot easier. So things like the health going down, that's a common technique that games programmers use. You kind of know they're going to store the health somewhere, they're going to load it into a register, they're going to decrease it. You just need to search through and find it. Um, one of the things that made that easier, I guess, was that um, I found the main loop of the game. And the main loop of the game does player control, calls a player control function, calls a controlling the ants function, calls a rendering the screen function. And once you've identified those individual routines, then it's pretty easy to find out where the bit you're interested is. Then you've still got to do a bit of searching to, to find it. But you're basically looking for bits of memory that change in response to something happening in the game. And then you can kind of find where the routine is.
Hello? Okay, now this works. Uh, first, thank you for the talk. My question was sort of the same. Uh, of course, with emulators today, you can do step-by-step -step execution and monitor the memory, which gives you a lot of help using this. But my question was uh, basically that how would you do this back in the days without such modern tools, without basically reverse engineering the whole game code? Um, I did a little bit of this back in the day, uh, and it was it's a very slow and long-winded process. Um, I think if you, if you wanted to do this, um, I was going to say professionally, not professionally, um, if you wanted to invest a lot of time and effort into this, you would probably buy a disk drive, and at least then the loading process would be quicker, because basically what, you'd be, what you would be doing would be loading the game up under control of a um, debugger, disassembler, putting breakpoints in, changing values, Sometimes you get that right, sometimes you get it wrong. When you get it wrong, the whole computer crashes. With an emulator, that's great, you just restart. When you're doing it with a real spectrum, yeah, it's just a, it's a slower process. Um, and the people who did this a lot, I think, just got very good at doing it. Um, the other thing, I, I guess, that's maybe related to this is that AntAttack has no um, protection or encryption on it. Um, this was 1983. Shortly after that, all the publishers started adding encryption onto their games. Um, most of those, the techniques to hack them were fairly well known. A new protection scheme would come out, somebody would work out how to hack it, and then it was completely wide open. Um, but there's still then an extra process. You've got to hack the protection before you can actually get into hacking the game. And attack is an easy target, there's no protection. Any more? If there's no more questions, thank you, Paul. Thank you.